Hey Valley Life, I'm Jared Johnson. I'm the worship leader at Valley Life Tremonto. Every week at Valley Life Church, we spend time in prayer together. Um, this is someone from the stage, leads us as we pray through um, these prompts that we're gonna go through together. We wanna be known as a church who prays and prays together, especially in these times. So I'm gonna lead us now as we pray. As we've seen a rise in the number of cases of COVID-19 this week, we ask God to slow the spread of this disease and quickly heal those who are sick. Next, pray for wisdom for our church, city, state, and national leaders, that they would make decisions, decisions rooted in wisdom in the coming days and weeks. Finally, as we prepare our hearts and minds to hear this sermon, ask God for hope that comes through the person and work of Jesus. Today's scripture reading comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 6, verses 13 through 20. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath so that by two unchangeable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steady anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Father, today, as we open your word, as we hear your word taught, we ask that you would transform our hearts, transform our minds, and we pray for a hope that only comes through Jesus. So Lord, as we hear this text today, as we hear it taught and preached, we pray that you, that you would encourage us as your people to go out as ambassadors of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, good morning, Valley Life Church. My name is Mike Lee, and I get to be the pastor here at Valley Life North Mountain. I wanna welcome you here today to church. I wanna welcome you to church wherever you're at. I'm so glad that you're here and I very much look forward to hearing from you today in the chat on our website or in the comments on our Facebook page. I have to tell you, this has been a crazy year so far. I mean, I looked down at the calendar just the other day and I realized it's only June and it feels like this has been one of those years that has already gone on for years and years and years. I mean, this year has been just crazy. You know, when I was thinking about this year and what it's felt like, I feel like this year has been a lot like that movie, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, except there is no chocolate, there's no fizzy lifting drink, there's no everlasting gobstoppers, and there is certainly no opportunity to win a chocolate factory. Now, if you've never seen that movie, you should totally do it. Like this afternoon, you should do it. You're probably stuck at your house anyway, so just check it out. It's about a guy who owns a chocolate factory. I mean, a chocolate factory, he owns this thing. I mean, hashtag dream job, hashtag uh, I like chocolate, hashtag stop saying hashtag like that because it's out and it ended so many years ago, but I don't care because this movie just makes me think about the fact that this this year has been like that. You see, anyways, in this movie, this guy, Willy Wonka, allows five kids the opportunity to tour his factory in the hopes that he will be able to pass the factory on to one of them. 
And of course, he gets four of the brattiest kids ever to walk the face of the earth. And then he gets this other good kid named Charlie. And throughout the tour, these kids learn lessons and they get eliminated from a chance to win the factory. And they learn these big, important lessons about not being rude and about uh, about being nice to people and about not like wanting everything that comes your way. And every single time the kids get eliminated, the factory workers called Oompa Loompas come out and they sing a song. And I actually read a Facebook post last week that said, I feel like at the end of each month in 2020, an Oompa Loompa should come out of the woodwork and sing us a song about a lesson that we should have learned over the past 30 days, but we didn't. And I gotta be honest with you, 2020 totally feels like that. Like it has been bad thing after bad thing after bad thing, and it has just been exhausting. Like in the very, very beginning, COVID-19 came out and we thought maybe it's no big deal. And then stay-at-home orders came out and we thought, well, maybe this is a bigger deal. And then racial tensions exploded over the killing of George Floyd. And then protests came out about those racial tensions and there was protests about all of that. And then wildfires in Arizona began to grow and so much of the Catalina Mountains in Tucson and so much of the area along the Beeline Highway has been burned. And then COVID-19 numbers continued to go up in Arizona and now people are arguing about masks and social distancing and whether or not we should close the state again. I want to tell you that if you wrote a movie about this year, nobody would want to go see it. There's just no way you'd want to go see a movie about this. As a matter of fact, this year is producing fear and anxiety. And it's producing a lot of questions. People have a lot of questions. Uh, just this week, I was talking to some students and their question was, will we be able to go back to school? And when we go back to school, what will school look like? Will we be able to play sports? Will we be able to hang out with our friends? And when will we be able to do that? It's producing questions like, should I wear a mask? And what will that do? And, and is it helpful if I do? And what will happen? It's producing all these questions. People have other questions too. And they're asking me, hey, pastor, when can we get back to church? And then there's other questions too. Like, what is it safe? What is safe to do? Like, what can we do that is safe? And who is safe to be around? It is just producing all of these questions. And again, as I think about this year, I am reminded of that movie, Willy Wonka, but it's really not the Oompa Loompa singing that I'm reminded of. I'm more reminded of that boat scene. Y'all remember the boat scene in Willy Wonka? This is a really scary scene. These kids are going down this chocolate river and it's terrifying. I don't know what it was about kids' movies in the 70s and 80s, but they always had some scary part. And for Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, the riverboat scene was the scariest part. They're going down this river, and Willy Wonka starts singing this song, and it's very, like, sort of terrifying, this song. He starts singing this song. He says, there's no earthly way of knowing which direction we are going. There's no knowing where we're rowing or which way the river's flowing, yet the danger must be growing, for the rowers keep on rowing and they're certainly not showing any signs that they are slowing and it's like ah whoa I mean I hated that scene as a matter of fact when I was a little kid and I would watch that movie I would fast forward it we didn't have a, a DVD player or anything like that or a blu-ray player where you could skip man this was VHS and so you just had to hit that forward button and so I would fast forward that scene or I would do my other favorite thing to do which was go to the kitchen and get a snack until it was over and I got to tell you, the last three months have felt a little bit like a bad scene in a good movie that I would much rather just fast forward or go to the kitchen and get a snack until it's over. You see, with so much change and so many questions and so much brokenness and so much anxiety, it can feel hopeless. It can literally feel hopeless. And I've talked with some people in the last couple of weeks who have felt hopeless. And it could be easy right now to take on that hopelessness. It could be so easy to take on that feeling of hopelessness. But Jesus. See, but Jesus. Because Jesus 
changes everything. You see, it could be easy to get overwhelmed, but Jesus. It could be easy to lose hope, but Jesus. It could be easy to fall into despair, but Jesus. You see, for those who know Jesus, for those who have believed in his life and death and resurrection, we do not face the circumstances of this world as those without hope. You see, because we know that our hope is not found in anything this world has to offer. Our hope is found in the one who has defeated the worst thing this world has to offer. Now, now I'm pausing here because I know that after what I just said, you would have said amen. If we were gathered up together in the church, you would have said amen to that. And I'm giving you just a second to type because I know that it takes longer to type amen than say amen. So go ahead and type amen. You see, as people with hope, as people with hope, We are people who can see beyond the things of this world, beyond the troubles right in front of us. We are, in fact, people who are convinced of better things. We are convinced of better things. We don't just think maybe something better is out there. No, we are people who are convinced of better things. And so today we are in our second week of this series And we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13 through 20. And so you can go ahead and turn there. I got to tell you that I love this text today. I love this text that we're going over because it will give us good reason to to join Justine and the worship team and sing today. See, a couple of weeks ago, Justine contacted me and she said, I have something special planned for the 21st, but I can't tell you what it is. Justine's one of those people that will tell you, I know something you don't know, and I want you to know that I know that you know that I know it and you don't. She's just one of those people, as it turns out. You get to know somebody when they get on your staff. I did not know this when I recruited her to come help us plant this church, but it turns out she's one of these people. She then said, it is a surprise. She said, Mike, it's a surprise. And I know about it and I can't tell you. And she said, but I'm really, really bad at surprises. So, so no matter what, please don't let me ruin it. This girl calls me up and says, I have a surprise and I don't want you to know about it, but I want you to keep me from ruining it for everyone else. And I got to tell you, church, that in the last two weeks, she has tried to ruin that surprise at least 5,000 times because she's so excited. And I still don't know what it is, but I am confident that today's text will give us good reason to sing with her and the worship team today. You see, because in a world of questions and confusion and uncertainty, we can be certain of God's promise. Really the big idea today, the thing that I want you to walk away with when you leave this sermon is this idea that we can be certain of God's promise. And this is really a big deal. We can be certain of God's promise. Not, we think God's promise may come true. Not, there's a pretty good chance that God's promise may come true. Not, I think probably if I do mostly good stuff, God's promise will mostly come true. No, not like that at all. The thing is, we can be certain of God's promise. And you might say, yeah, but have you seen what's going on? Have you seen the racism and the violence and the COVID-19 and the arguments over masks and the murder hornets and all of it? And I would say yes, but we can still be confident of God's promise. Now, I want you to remember that the author of Hebrews, the one writing this letter, is writing to a mostly Jewish population. And some of them have believed in Jesus as their savior, and some others are struggling to believe in Jesus. And the author is spending most of this letter telling them all about Jesus and reminding them that Jesus is just flat out better than anything else. Better than priests, better than kings, better than laws or traditions. Jesus is just better. And so in today's text, he's going to use some history to remind his audience about the confidence that they have in the promise of God. The author is going to remind his audience and those of us gathered up today that God has been faithful to his promise in the past 
And that gives us the confidence that God will be faithful to his promise in the future. You know, sometimes as Christians, we have momentary struggles with our faith. We may find ourselves in difficult times and wonder where God is at in them. And it is always helpful to remember to look backwards at how God has brought us through those difficult times. So a couple of years ago, right before we planted this church, Penny and I were going through a difficult season. We had just come to the end of one season and we were getting ready to go into the next season of our lives and we were going through a difficult season. And I remember feeling confused about what we were supposed to do. I remember being confused about whether or not we were supposed to plant this church. I remember being confused about where we would plant it if we did or how we could plant it. I just felt very confused and it made me question where God was in all of that. And so one day, Penny just reminded me, she just reminded me of all the times in our life that God had been with us and for us all the difficult seasons he had brought us through, all the times he had provided for us, and looking back on God's work in our lives helped us to look forward, knowing that God had never left us before and he would not start now. And the author of Hebrews is doing something very similar here. He's going to do something very similar. And so let's get into the text. We're going to be in Hebrews 6, 13 through 14. It says here, For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swore, to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. So to understand what's going on here, we need to do a little bit of history. You see, like I said before, when I first became a Christian and I started to attend church, I would go and the guy standing up in a situation like what I'm doing, he would say names of people like Abraham or Moses or Paul. And I had no idea who they were. And I told myself even then that if I ever had the chance, I wouldn't do that to people. So I want to explain to you who Abraham is. If you went way back to the beginning of the Bible, all the way back in the book of Genesis, you would see that God decided to make a people for himself. God wanted to make a people for himself. And so he picked Abraham to be the father of those people. Abraham was an old man and his wife, Sarah, was an old woman and they had not had any children. The Bible tells us that they were past the age of having children, but God came and he chose Abraham and he said, I am going to make you the father of a nation. He said, your offspring are going to be like the sand and it's going to, they're going to be like the stars in the sky. Basically, he said, you are going to have countless descendants. And God promised that this would happen. He made a promise that that would happen. And in God's timing, it did happen. Abraham and Sarah had a son named Isaac, and that was the beginning of the Jewish people to whom our author in Hebrews is writing this letter. So the first thing that I want you to know today, church, is that we can be certain of God's promises because he has kept them in the past. I want to say that again. We can be certain of God's promises because he has kept them in the past. You see, God promised Abraham and Sarah that they would have a baby, and they did. God promised to make Abraham the father of a large nation, and he did. God has a perfect track record of keeping his promise. He has never lied. He's never gone back on his word. God is perfect, and his ways are perfect. And so that means that those reading this letter 2,000 years ago, and also those gathered up while this letter is being preached in 2020 can be certain of God's promise because he has always kept his promises. The text goes on in Hebrews 6, 16 through 17. It says, for God's, it says, for people swear by something greater than themselves. And in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. And when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So we know that when people really want to have people believe them, they'll tend to swear on something. 
Like if you were to go to court, they would ask you to place your hand on a Bible like this and swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Or you may be tempted to say, I swear to God. Or maybe even when you were a little kid, you would say, I swear and hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. Oftentimes, when trying to convey the severity of an oath, we will swear on something greater than ourselves. And in the case of God, there is nothing greater than himself. And so when he makes this oath to Abraham, he literally swears on himself. Our text said, God guaranteed it with an oath. And verse 13 says, that oath was made by the only thing big enough to hold the oath of God, which is God himself. I want you to know today, church, that we can be certain of God's promise because he swears it on himself. Now I'm going to tell you that as a little kid, I used to swear on a whole lot of stuff. For example, I used to swear on my mom. Sorry, mom, if you're listening. Sorry if you're watching, but I used to swear on my mom. Like one time, my my friend in the neighborhood, Jesse Arroyo, asked me, he said, hey, did you steal my candy? And I was like, no, man. And he said, put it on your mom. And so I was like, hey, I put it on my mom. I didn't steal your candy. And then I was sort of nervous till I got home and made sure that mom was okay because I had totally stole his candy. I've told you before, I wasn't always a Christian. I also did that stick and needle in my eye oath. Several times I would do that thing. No, no, I swear and hope to die. Stick a needle in my eye. And I broke that oath a lot as a little kid. And I never stuck a needle in my eye. I mean, who would do that? That would hurt. So I never did that. You see, I swore on a lot of things that did not back up the word of a little punk kid. But when God swears, he swears on himself. God is forever. He is the beginning and the end. He is eternal. And so when he promises something, we can be certain of it because that which he promises on is unchanging. I want you to know, church, that those reading this letter 2,000 years ago and those studying this letter in 2020 can be confident in God's promise because God has always been and will always be. It is the same God who made the world, the same God that made a promise to Abraham, the same God of the Hebrews, the same God of today. And when he promises, he promises on himself. But we have even more confidence than that. Hebrews 6.18 says, So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. Did you see that? Did you see that in verse 18? Take a look at that. It is impossible for God to lie. It is impossible for God to lie. It's not like unlikely for God to lie. It's not like improbable for God to lie. It is impossible for God to lie. I want you to know today, church, that we can be certain of God's promise because it is impossible for God to lie. I want you to just stop and think about this for a minute. It is impossible for God to lie. God simply cannot lie. God has always been and he always will be and he has never lied, not even once, not ever. Now, most people cannot get through one day without lying. Heck, just yesterday, I was playing War, that card game War, with my daughter, Courtney. I I think her picture is up on the screen. She's the little one, not the the taller one. That's her posed with Ray back when you used to be able to go to Disneyland. Doesn't she look so cute? Well, let me tell you something about that cute little girl. During that game, she stole one of my cards. We were doing that thing where you're throwing the cards down and play War. And when she went to get one, she took an extra card. She took one out of my pile. And I said, did you steal my card? And she said, no. For shame, for shame, for shame. She lied right to my face. And I was like, yes, you did. And she said, yeah, but it was only to get back at you for cheating last time we played Monopoly. But, but, but we don't need to talk about that. You see, we lie for all kinds of reasons. And of course, it's not okay to lie, but we lie for all kinds of reasons. Sometimes we lie to get ahead. Sometimes we lie to make others look bad. Sometimes we lie to make ourselves look better. We lie to each other and even to ourselves. And some people, 
the worst kind of people will even lie to win a game of Monopoly. And all of us have experienced the pain of being lied to. Lied to by people we trusted, lied to by people we loved, lied to by people who were not supposed to lie to us, but God is simply incapable of lying. And so the people reading this letter 2,000 years ago and also the people studying this letter in 2020 can be confident in God's promise because he simply cannot lie. Our God cannot lie. And so when he promises us something, we can be confident in it. But it's even better than that. Hebrews 6, 19 through 20 goes on to say, We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Okay, this is really, really good news. This news is worthy of singing about, but again, we may need some historical context. You see, before Jesus and the Jewish religion, there was a high priest. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. There was a high priest, and the high priest would enter the temple to the Holy of Holies. This was the place where God was. This place was so holy that only the high priest was allowed to enter. And so he would go past the curtain to this very holy place. But before he did, he would tie bells to his robe and a rope around his leg. This way, if the people outside did not hear the bell anymore, they could assume the priest had passed out or even died. And then because they couldn't go in to retrieve him, they would use the rope to pull him out. So this place is a pretty big deal. This is a holy place. It is a holy place that no one could enter except the priest. But then Jesus comes along and changes everything. It says, we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner. You see, we have a steadfast anchor to the soul. We have a hope that allows us to go into this holy place, this place so holy that only the high priest could go until Jesus came. But now you and I can approach this holy place because Jesus has done everything necessary for us to go in there. And we don't have to walk in with a rope tied to our legs We can walk in confidently as people whose very hope is anchored in Jesus. And Jesus is the great high priest in the order of Melchizedek, who we'll talk more about next week. But for today, we can just celebrate because we can be certain of God's promise because of the finished work of Jesus. We are people who can be certain of God's promise because of the finished work of Jesus. A couple of weeks ago when Matt Mueller preached, he said that we could approach the throne of God with confidence. And Matt was so right. Isn't Matt so awesome? And isn't he going to plant a fabulous church in North Peoria? You should join me in continuing to pray for him and his team. Matt is going to do a terrific job. And Matt was so right when he said that because we can approach the throne of God with confidence because of the finished work of Jesus. God knew that we were sinners and as such could never ever save ourselves. And so he sent Jesus, his one and only son, on a rescue mission to save us. And while Jesus was here, he lived the perfect life that you and I never could. He died the horrific death that you and I deserve, and he defeated that death so that anyone who would believe in him, anyone who would believe in him could spend eternity in heaven with him. And because of what Jesus did, we can walk right up to the holiest of places. We can walk right up to God because our hope is anchored in Jesus. And so, No matter what's going on in the world, 
No, what, no matter what kind of disease or even death comes our way, no matter how bad people treat each other, no matter how lost or confused we feel at the time, no matter how much we mess up, we are a people of hope. We believe the promises of a God who has always kept his promise who swears an oath on his own almighty name, who is incapable of lying, and whose promise was fulfilled in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And because of all of that, we can believe God. You know, God has given us his word. He's given us his word, and he's made so many promises throughout his word. And I think that maybe none of them is more powerful than the promises recorded in Romans chapter 8. It's one of the most encouraging chapters of the entire Bible. Last summer, we actually spent about a month going over just this chapter, and we called it our most encouraging summer ever. And I think today, if you're like me, if you have been living in this world for the last three months, maybe today you could use some encouragement. And so today I want to just read you a section out of Romans chapter 8. And I want to read it to you today in the hopes that you will believe it. I'm going to be reading in Romans chapter 8 verse 31 to 39. I would welcome you to just listen to these promises. Paul writes, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all of us, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charges against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God? Who is indeed interceding for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sleep to be slaughtered. No! In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I know that the people are saying amen. And I would ask you today, church, can you believe that promise? Can you believe that promise that no matter what happens, Jesus is for you and he will never leave you? That nothing could separate you from his love. Neither anything you have done or anything that you have thought or anything that has been done to you. Can you believe that promise today? Can you believe in the promise of God? Can you believe that no matter how bad it gets, God is for you and he is with you? Can you believe? Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your promise. We thank you for promises like Paul recorded in Romans chapter 8. And Lord, I ask today that as we read those words that you have left for us, that you would help us to believe, that you would help us to believe in new ways. That in spite of everything that's happening and everything that we are witnessing right now, that the thing that we would hold on to most, Lord, is you. And God, if there are people today that are watching this sermon or listening to this podcast that have never believed in you, that have never grabbed hold of your promise, Lord, I ask you today to save them. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Now, church, I've said this several times, but whenever the gospel is preached, a response is required. You can't simply hear the gospel of Jesus and then say, "Mm, okay, thank you. You see, whenever the gospel is preached, a response is required, and I've only been able to imagine a couple of ways to respond. And so today, I would tell you, if you are a Christian, if you have believed in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, I want to give you three ways to respond today. I want to give you three ways to respond in confidence to the promise of God. And these are good ways to respond in celebration. The first is this, I want you to sing 
I can't wait to see what Justine has been working on, but whatever it is, I want you to join in and I want you to sing today. The second thing is that I want you to give. This church has been so generous and so in a celebratory fashion, I would love for you to join us in giving. This church has been meeting so many needs. This church has met so many needs in the community. We have provided food, you have provided diapers, you have provided electricity, you have provided rent, and most importantly, you have provided the hands and feet of Jesus to people that do not know him yet. And so join us in that generosity by following the instructions on the screen. And the third way that you could celebrate today if you are a Christian is to take the Lord's Supper. And as you do, proclaim Jesus' victory over death until he comes back here and makes everything right. This is a victory that allows you to approach the Holy of Holies with confidence. And the other response is if you're not a Christian. I'm not naive enough to think that everybody that's watching today is a Christian. And so if you are not a Christian, I want you to become one. I want you to have the hope that comes with being someone who can be confident of God's promise. And you could do that right now. You could pray. You could simply pray, I am a sinner and I am sorry. Jesus, I believe in your life, death, and resurrection. I cannot save myself, and I need you to save me. And if you just did that, or if you would like to talk to someone about doing that, will you just text BELIEVE to the number on the bottom of the screen? You see, I would love nothing more to do today than to reach out and talk to you. And the third response is this, if you are not ready, if you're not a Christian and you're not ready, maybe you came today and it's your first time, I wanna invite you to come back. I just wanna invite you to come back. This church would love to care for you and pray for you until you're ready to believe. And so let's get ready to sing. Let's all stand up and join Justine on this phenomenal surprise that hopefully she's been able to keep. I love you church and I'll see you soon. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb Till I met you I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my truth Till I met you You called my name And I when I met you. My 
sin was heavy chains break at the weight of your glory i needed shelter i was an orphan now you call me a citizen of heaven when i was broken you were my healing now you're to the skies But there's no space between you and I Wherever I go Oh, my soul, what a beautiful day. 